that Isa claimed to be God. This is, this is uh, a, a, a discussion that comes up between Christians and Muslims all of the time, right? We say he is a prophet, a mess, a messiah, he is the servant of Allah and so on. And our Christian friends say that he is your Lord and Savior. So how do we resolve this uh, point? Well, uh, first we should notice that uh, there are four Gospels in, in the Bible. Each one uh, is a portrayal of Isa a.s. Something about his life and his teachings and so on. And more like a kind of a biography. Like the Sira works. We, in, in, in Islam we have hadith which are collected sayings and reported actions about the Prophet or reports of things happen, uh, that happen in his presence. Uh, which now become precedent for Islamic law if he didn't object to those things, right? So, uh, little snippets. Hadiths are little snippets of information. But the sira are connected works. And uh, if you think about the process of somebody memorizing something, it's easy to memorize like one little snippet than to memorize a whole long connected story. Uh, so, uh, in, in the hadith, you have the little snippets which are quite clearly uh, uh, and... and uh, uh, in a stringent manner scrutinized, but uh, in the Sira works you have longer stories, but they're not scrutinized that much, because by the time you start scrutinizing them, you find weaknesses here and there, if you don't have the long connected story anymore. In uh, What do we have in the Gospels? We have the long connected stories. And um, uh, it, it took a while for these stories to be circulated orally, and they eventually compiled in these books. This is the order in which they are found in the Bible. Matthew first. I've given it Matt for short, right? Uh, as if this is Matt Damon. It's not Matt Damon. It's Matthew. Okay? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, John. Um, these are said to be the authors of these, of these books. But the books themselves, uh, the, the, the earliest known, uh, the, the earliest these books are known, uh, they can only be classified as anonymous books. Right? Um, uh, but... Some early Christian tradition said that Matthew wrote that one and Luke wrote that one and so on. Uh, these are, at best, largely educated guesses. Although, um, hardly anyone doubts that the name Luke should be associated with this one, uh, but he was not known to be a disciple of Isa a.s. So, there are disciples who are known by name, his, uh, the ones who lived with him and walked with him, like traveled with him and so on, and whom he specifically appointed, these are my disciples, to go and teach everyone. Um, Luke was not one of them. Uh, the names Matthew and, and John are names of disciples, but uh, nowadays uh, uh, Christian scholars themselves largely uh, say that uh, these are, in their present form, these books are not by these named authors. Uh, these are names that were ascribed to these books by uh, people with nice, pious intention. They like to think that these books are written by disciples of Isa al Islam, but no good evidence for that. As for Mark, he also is thought to be not a disciple of Isa al Islam, even by traditional Christians. They, they thought he was a disciple of Peter, who was a disciple of Isa al Islam. So we're getting things like second and third hand in these books. What is important, though, is for us to see that while this is the order in the Bible now, Matthew and then Mark, uh, historians now think that actually it's this order, Mark first, and then Matthew uh, and Luke. Uh, Matthew and Luke somewhere in this period after Mark, and then John is the, is the last of the four. Now, it is important for us to know this kind of information and, and, and know this very well. Uh, because in the past, if you're familiar with some uh, books written by Sheikh Didat and so on, and if you've looked at some of his videos of debates he's had and things like this, then you'll be familiar with some ways of dealing with the Bible. Like you pull a verse here and you mention it, and you, you, you prove a thing by mentioning one verse. But uh, this is called proof texting. Uh, th this, uh, and it's, it, it, in modern times, people, uh, you know, uh, have a thing against proof texting. Because we know that if you go like this, you can prove almost anything. Uh, you, you just cherry pick what you like and you prove the point that you want to make. Uh, and while the Muslim will be pulling some verses and proving a point based on those few verses, the Christian will be pulling a few verses 
and making a point based on those few verses. And now it becomes like a clash of civilizations here. You pulling some verses, he pulling some verses, and at the end of the day we can't make heads or tails of it. We just have two different views, right? So now what we're trying to do here is to have a comprehensive view. We want to know who wrote this books when, these books, when did they write them, for what reason, how did the information change from one to another, how did it so happen that some people come to think that Jesus, alayhi salam, they claim to be God. Uh, how did it so happen that there are, in the same uh, book, some verses which are supporting the Muslim view, and some verses which Christians can cite as supporting their view? That's what we need to resolve now. Right? Because we've heard it. The Muslim was saying, Based, uh, Jesus is not God, look at the verses. And the Christian is saying, but he is God, look at the verses. So, how did this Bible come to have the verses which Muslims like and the verses which Christians like? So this is what we want to find out. And we're getting behind the scenes now because the first uh, observation is that uh, Mark is first and John is last. You have to know this now because you will see as we go from Mark to John how the information about Isa al Islam changes. Okay? So it's like somebody writing a story, somebody coming later on writing basically the same story but with some changes. We want to see the direction of that change. How is the information traveling? Where is it going now? Uh, and what is happening to the image of Isa al Islam? How is he being photoshopped from one gospel to another? This is what we need to know. So we want to get back, trace, trace it back. Okay? So what you need to remember from this is not all of these names, but you have to focus in. Sometimes you try to remember too much becomes too much, we can't remember all of it, so we just forget the whole thing, right? But you need to focus in on what specifically you want to remember. So let's say you want to remember a date, for example, right? If you know it was like 20 years ago, then you, you don't have to remember the specific year anymore, you just have to know this year, and it's minus 20, right? So you simplify things like this. Uh, so in a sim similar way, if you want to uh, remember Mark is first and John is last, Let's just look at that alone. That's all we need to look at now. Mark, John. That's all we have to remember because the rest will be elementary. Once we, once we remember Mark is first and John is last, we know the other two are in between. True? And we can always find the names later on. How would you find the names? How, how would you find the names? I mentioned it when I said Deuteronomy. How do you find the name Deuteronomy? Huh? Yeah, just open the Bible, go to the contents page, which is after the introduction and whatever, you know, contents page is there. You will find the list of all of the individual books within the Bible right there. Huh? So you go on the New Testament, it will say Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but you know it is Mark first and John last. So you need a way to remember that Mark is first and John is last. Because if you don't have that Bible with you, and you don't remember the names anymore, then uh, you want to remember at least these two. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, you can say, look, Mark is the first gospel, and Mark presents Jesus very much as a human being. He has limitations, which shows that he's not God. Uh, but, but John presents him as the creator of the world. So he went from like a human being to a creator of humans, from Mark to John. So that's, what, that's the gist of the argument right there. Okay? You're standing at a bus stop, uh, you only have 30 seconds because the bus is going to come and uh, you're going to catch one and the other person is going to catch the other one. So you want to finish this story in just 30 seconds. So that's all you, you have to tell them. And Mark was the first, John was the last, and between Mark and John, Jesus has been photoshopped. Started out as a human being, he ended up as the creator of all human beings. Hmm? Story done. Get on your bus. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Okay, so how are you going to remember Mark is first? Well, one way, I mean, you can make up your own, you see if you make up stories and so on, you, when we were children we did this, but we don't anymore. We remember the nursery rhymes because uh, they were funny, they rhymed, and, and they were silly even, like, you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill and Jack fell down and broke his crown and all of that. Um, it didn't, doesn't make any sense really, but, but you know, that's how we learned language, right? But we remember those rhymes uh, partly because they're silly, partly because they rhyme, and so on. Mm -hmm. So make up your own way of remembering this, yes. Can you get this? You see, when Mark was, Mark described Jesus as a man, mm -hmm. and John described as a, as a God. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what okay. And of course, not 
quite, but, but that's the general idea. That's, that's, that's right, basically. Uh, I, I, would, I would add that in, in Mark, he's not, a, he's not quite the way Muslims would like to see him, in that he's called, for example, Son of God in Mark. But uh, you can explain that uh, in Mark, even though he's called Son of God, this is like Sons of God in the Old Testament. Um, you see, that's what Sheikh Didat would have said too. But Sheikh Didat would have said it even if it's about the Gospel according to John. But it doesn't quite work in the Gospel according to John. And this is where Christians are not buying the argument. This is why you know, some of them become uh, uh, even more vociferous in their objections. Because they're thinking uh, that we Muslims don't really know the Bible and we're just picking and choosing and saying anything just to defend our own views. Uh, so it's more correct to say that in, in Mark, Jesus appears very much like a human being with limitations which show that he's not God. Right? Uh, but still, if, if we were to put like a human being here and say, okay, this is how uh, this human being in Mark, Jesus would be higher, a little bit higher than a human being. Right? A little bit taller. So he's still photoshopped there. But in, in the Gospel according to John, like he's going through the roof. <laughs> Okay, so this is the important point. We want to show that there is that trend. And then we will take the argument one step further. But for the moment, guys, just remember that Mark is first and John is last. So how might we remember that? Make up something silly. Like say, for example, uh, before you, in the start of a race, first you get on your mark. Right? First you get on your mark, then you get set, then you go. Right? So first, mark. Okay? Although it's reversed, but anyway. Uh, so, first Mark. First Mark. And, okay, so you know that Mark is first. John, how might you remember that John is the last of the four Gospels? Yeah? John, I don't know. But, but there's a song that says, Johnny, come lately, new kid in town. Have you heard that song before? So, if that song is playing in your mind, then you know it, right? John. Johnny come lately. That's John is last. So uh, Mark is first. John is last. That's all you have to say, and you have given an entire uh, piece of power right there. Now let's look at some dates. It is said that Mark is written somewhere around 65 to 75 A.D., and uh, Isa alayhi salam would have been taken up around uh, the year 30 A.D. I'll see that later on. I'll put the date on as we go to another slide. John. It's said to be written between 90 to 100 A.D. Notice we only have approximate dates because these things are not uh, thoroughly documented in history that Mark was sitting here. and this, We don't even know who the persons were, actually. Mark was a very common name at the time. So it could have been anyone you know, from among a dozen people with the same name. Uh, John, too. Like, John is a common name now. But then, too, John was a common name. So we don't know who exactly was this uh, John. But... There was a John who was a disciple of Isa alayhi salam, and uh, there is a complex theory that um, that disciple compiled some memories about uh, Isa alayhi salam. He preached those memories. Uh, then uh, somebody else uh, took those uh, and preached them further. And uh, then eventually, uh, from this, uh, at the end result of his preaching, uh, he, he wrote that down. And, uh, you, and, and you know, the preaching here is important for you to, for you to understand. Like, why is it mentioned? That, what, what's it got to do with the preaching? Well, you know when people preach, and we all do this, like if you listen to a khatib, he will mention a verse of the Quran, it'll be in Arabic, and then like, let's say he's elaborating, he's giving you an English khutbah or Urdu khutbah, and he's talking to you, or, or let's say an Urdu bayan, because some, okay? So let's say he's giving you a bayan in Urdu, and he's mentioning a, an ayah from the Quran in Arabic, and then uh, you, you can tell the difference, right? He mentioned the Arabic, now he's mentioning the Urdu, right? But let's say he's giving uh, a, a bayan in Arabic. So, he will mention the Quran and he'll mention his own elaboration of this, and it's all in Arabic, and if you knew the ayah from memory already, you know which is the ayah and which is not. But if you didn't already know the ayah from memory, you wouldn't know which is the ayah, where, it's, where it ended. You have an idea, now he's referring to the ayah, but you don't know when he stopped, and when he started to give his own words. So, eventually, the preaching and the original thing that was being preached about uh, become fused together. 
So this is what happened with the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. When preachers went out and they were preaching that Jesus said this and this is what it means, uh, they didn't always stop and say, well, now I'm telling you what it means. It just, uh, you know, all flowed into each other. And eventually, when it all gets written down, everything gets written as though it is the words of Isa alayhi salam, but it's actually word plus commentary, and sometimes more commentary than word. So, uh, this... Um, uh, John's Gospel then, there's a complex theory, but you don't have to be familiar with the entire theory, but you just need to know in a nutshell that uh, the, the thing did not get written all at once. It was a process through which the teachings of Isa a.s. was being preached about and eventually written down, and not only in John, for that matter, but in all of the Gospels. Um, but you see the length of time that transpires. So from that time, from about 75 A.D. to about 90, a period of 15 years uh, at least in between, and the story about Isa a.s. continues to be preached. This is what is happening then. The story continues to be preached. So Mark wrote down a Gospel, at least we have something in writing, but the story didn't stop there. People are still preaching orally. And so, so they're still doing what the khatibs do. Like mentioning and commenting, mentioning and commenting, and eventually the new comments are all meshed in with the mention. Right? So uh, whatever was said before is now going on uh, some more. It's like a snowball. The more you roll it around, the bigger it gets. So the story about Isa a.s. is being rolled around, it's getting bigger, and uh, the image of Isa a.s. is increasing uh, over time. It's becoming bigger, taller, greater, more knowledgeable, uh, and so on in these stories. Right? So we're moving away from the original man, and we're promoting him now, or he's being promoted in these writings as a god. In John's Gospel, he's still not quite God, and this is what uh, I wanted to clarify. Still not quite God. Uh, this is why Jehovah's Witnesses will come to your door and say, we don't believe that Jesus is God. But they will say he is the Son of God. And, and literally the Son of God. Not like Mark anymore. Remember we said in Mark's Gospel, Son of God, but he could be like one of the sons of God of the Old Testament. Which means a man who is beloved, by God, beloved to God. He is... Uh, you know, uh, approved by God, is a righteous man, uh, like a man might meet a child and say, you are my son. So it doesn't mean literally that you are my son, that I fathered you, it means that I love you and I respect you and uh, um, I, I can care for you, right? It's uh, um, like an adopt, not even a formal adoption, but but uh, a, a mark of, uh, of, of respect. This is my, uh, you know, I... I feel some tenderness towards you. Hmm? Uh, but in John's Gospel, Jesus is uh, something special. John's Gospel says that Jesus is the Word of God. This is an idea that uh, God does not interact with the world directly, but He interacts through His reason or through His, his uh, and, and they use the Greek terms, two terms, Sophia, which is a fe female, grammatical, grammatically female term, or logos, which is grammatically male, but it refers to the same concept, that uh, the, the God's reason. So he doesn't deal with the world directly, he deals with the world through his reason. Now John is saying that that very reason of God, that logic, that, that, that uh, logos of God, became a man. And that was Jesus. And, and it is that logos that created the world. So Jesus basically created the world. So this is a special position now. So if a Muslim comes and says, Oh, the Bible says that Jesus is like a human prophet and so on, and you include the Gospel of John in that, your Christian friends are going to think that you're disingenuous. You're, you're not being honest about the Bible. Uh, either because you don't know it or because you're devious. You know it and you're hiding the facts. Hmm? So now we need to be clear. Um, and, and this is the clarity you need to bring to this discussion. Jesus has been changed over time in the view of these writers, and uh, we need to get back to the original. So we need to be familiar with dates and stuff. So that's why we, we, we want to know this. We don't want to know just simply one verse that we're going to knock them down with. We want to see the whole comprehensive thing. So, continue. Uh, so we have Mark written around that time, John written around that time, this you've seen before. Now I've introduced this. Hmm? So that's Matthew and Luke somewhere in between. This is around uh, uh, 75 to 85, something like this, hmm? is the period in which, uh, oh, some say maybe 80 to 90. And again, these are guesses. Different scholars give different dates, so that's not uh, so significant. Uh, but you know that Matthew and Luke is somewhere in between. And whether Matthew is written before Luke or Luke written before Matthew, this too is not known. These are just uh, 
the scholars can only make some good guesses here and not very precise ones. Now, to continue, what is known now is that Matthew and Luke are both copied from Mark. And uh, Matthew and Luke are not just simply copying, but they are improving as they go. So if in Mark's Gospel you find that on, a, on an occasion it looks like Jesus doesn't know everything, then in Matthew and Luke the story is improved, so now it looks like he does know. Or at least it doesn't look so much like he doesn't know anymore. Alright, the story is improved. Uh, if it looks in Mark's Gospel like Jesus uh, on an occasion that uh, is limited by in his powers, then in Matthew and, and Luke, it looks like he has much more powers. doesn't have those limitations to the same degree. So you see again, Jesus is being photoshopped from one gospel to another. And that's as we go from Mark to Matthew and Luke, and later on as we go to John, it's uh, even more than this. Now just for your information and for completeness, uh, scholars believe that... Uh, uh, there is another document which they call Q because they don't know that document anymore. It doesn't exist in a physical form anymore but independently. They just know that there are some passages which are in Matthew and Luke which are so identical in wording that they must have come from a common source. And so they posit that common source and they call it Q uh, which is the initial letter for Quella in German which means source. So basically they're saying that Matthew and Luke copied from a certain source, and we don't know what that source is, so we'll call it source. And because the German scholars were the first to work on this, they call it Quelle in their language, which means source. So Matthew and Luke then are said to be derived from Mark and from Q. So basically they followed the outline of Mark, so the stories are identical. So you go story by story, you see Mark wrote that, and then it's also in Matthew and Luke, sometimes in one of them, but not both. Um, uh, but almost always. But only three episodes from the, uh, Mark's Gospel can be divided up into 83 episodes altogether, 83 smaller components, and only three of those are not in either Matthew or Luke. All the rest you will find either there or there, and sometimes in both. And so, so they were following basically those episodes one after another from Mark. But now, what did they take from Q? Mainly sayings. Sayings of Isa a.s. So Q might have been a compilation of the sayings of Isa a.s. Which is interesting because when we think of the gospel of Isa a.s. Remember the Quran says, Allah will teach him. The, the book and the wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. So Allah will teach him the gospel. So that gospel which Allah taught Isa alayhi uh, salam, which, which, which of those would it be? Would it be Mark? Would it be Matthew? Would it be Luke? Would it be John? Which? Q. Um, or as we can say now, none of the above, right? <laughs> none of the above. And then, uh, but, but you're right in, in anticipating that we'll get to Q in this way because well, something like you, uh, because uh, it, it, it must be that the gospel which Allah taught Isa alayhi salam, that is the one which Isa alayhi salam then preached to people, and his preaching would have been his words. It wouldn't be like a document that says, oh, he was born in that year, and then when he was 30 years old, then he went there, and uh, that's somebody else telling us about Isa alayhi salam, right? But what Isa alayhi salam himself preached in his own words would be his words, which are compiled in a document like Q. Uh, but Q itself is, is late, so we have to put some dates now. When was Q? Let's see. So we have it that uh, Isa alayhi salam was raised to heaven, uh, and Muslims and Christians be, uh, can share that language. Isa alayhi salam was raised to heaven, regardless of whatever disagreements we have. At least we agree he was raised to heaven. When? Around the year 30. I'm sorry that this is so low. Let me um, see if I can raise this a bit. Um, because some of the sisters are having difficulty at the back, I can tell that. Um, yeah, if, if, I can, if I can raise it by putting something underneath, that would be put good. That, put that Bible underneath you. Yeah, uh, it would be a disrespectful oh, use of the, the Bible, bag. no? Yeah. How about that? Would that work? 
yeah, it's, not, it's my fault for, for designing everything so uh, low on the page there. Uh, hopefully that's a little bit better. Sisters, can you see that? Can you see these dates now? So, uh, race to heaven around the year 30. Scholars say anywhere from between 30 and 30. It's either year 30 or 33. Uh, and, and nobody knows for sure. Uh, and it's not between. It's either this year or thir it's either 30 or 33. Generally, they say that. Okay. And then Mark written about um, at least 30 years after that. And then Matthew and Luke somewhere in between and John. So now, how many years after Isa alayhi salam left the scene is John's gospel compiled? You can see, 60 years at least, right? So that means that for six decades, the stories about Isa alayhi salam is being preached about. And then eventually, and all of that mixing occurs until eventually they're recorded in the gospel according to John. So if you find something in the gospel according to John that it said that Jesus said this, is that dependable? No. In fact, in none of them is it actually dependable, but you can say it's more dependable here and less dependable here. And now you know, now you know that if you are having a discussion with a Christian friend and you are saying, look, Isa alayhi salam is a prophet, he is a human being. So if you want to support your argument, where might you best find that support? You might find it in Mark. If the Christian wants to find support that Isa alayhi salam is God, he is the creator of the world, because that, they will look for John, right? Even in John, he's not quite God, but because he's the creator of the world, see, there's the God, and God made Jesus, and then Jesus created the world. So when, when they will find references that show Jesus to be like somebody great, like he created the world, so they're thinking that means he's God. Not quite, and not quite, but they will find this support here. So when they quote you something, what do you think is it, if you don't know, I mean, you don't have the Bible with you and whatever, uh, what do you think is a good question? Suppose somebody says to you, uh, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So, Sheikh Didat would have said, well, uh, what does he mean by one? Because uh, elsewhere it says that uh, the disciples prayed, uh, uh, Jesus prayed for God to make the disciples uh, one with us. So, if, if being one means... If being one with God means that you become God, then the disciples would become gods too, right? And, and so, so you can argue it that way, that that's one way. But, but now, given this kind of information, suppose somebody says this to you now, what's a different way of approaching this problem? How do you know Jesus Ask said that? them where it came from, exactly. Ask them where it came from. Can you tell me which gospel that comes from? <coughs> and they will tell you that comes from the gospel of John. And in that case, you can say, oh, wait a minute, that's a red flag. Right? Hmm? Exactly. You can ask them, why does it not say that in, in Mark? You see, now, uh, it, it, it is true that sometimes something happens and it's not recorded everywhere. Right? You, you, you know, I, I don't know what papers you, you have. The Guardian, you have the Independent, you, you have the Times. Okay, so some event happens. If it's an event of importance, then it will be in all of the papers. If it's of lesser importance, maybe one paper uh, deems it fit to, you know, an editorial board is going to make a decision on this. Do, is this going to sell? Is it going to make money or not? Okay. Uh, or whatever considerations, right? So some decide to publish it, some decide not to publish it. But if something is of grave importance, it's going to be in all the papers. Nothing to decide here is a no-brainer. It just has to be published, right? And so, if Isa alayhi salam did something to show that he is God, or he said something to show that he is God, what do you think? Do you think that's going to be in all of the papers? Yes. yes, of course. If somebody claims to be God, this is big news. It's the biggest news ever because, you know, it doesn't happen. Uh, it probably didn't happen. Well, in Christian, in Christian theology, it didn't happen before. Uh, and, it, and it's not going to happen again, ever. There's only one time in history where a man um, was God. So it, this had better be in, be, be in all of the Gospels. In all, every, every preacher will be saying this, you know, what happened? And let me tell you who Jesus was. And, and then they will go on and on about how, about how he is God. Every writer would say the same thing. So if, if, if Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and if this means that that means he's claiming to be God, well then all of the Gospels would write this, not just simply John. So why is it absent from the others? So there's another passage that say that Jesus said, uh, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. They tell you this, best thing to ask them, where does it come from? 
lost, according to John. Oh, another red flag, you see? And this is how you can go on. Now with this, now your, your, your answers are simple. You know, a, a good theory uh, explains many things. So, uh, the, the, the idea then, this is our theory then, that Mark is written first, John is written last, and the information about Isa is uh, uh, modified as we go, so that Isa a.s. looks bigger and greater, it looks, looks more like he's the creator of the world by the time we get to John. And uh, so, that, that one theory explains a lot. So, you don't have to find individual explanations for all of these verses anymore. The one theory settles it all. Okay? And, and that now shows why you are on good ground when you quote something from Mark to show that Jesus has some limitation. So when, for example, you quote from Mark, Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, that to show that Isa a.s. does not know when the day of judgment will occur, then you're on good ground. Because if there is one fact that he does not know, then he's not the all-knowing God. Simply quote, right? And that comes from the Gospel according to Mark. Incidentally, it's also repeated in Matthew. So sometimes it is, so sometimes the limitation or something like that is, because Matthew and Luke is fo uh, following Mark so closely, sometimes they do have the same information. Uh, and in this case, Matthew does have that um, uh, declaration as well, showing that Isa Alayhi Salam does not know when the Day of Judgment will occur. But if we didn't have this apparatus, what might happen is that you might quote that passage, and then the Christian will say, well, you know, that just shows that Isa Alayhi Salam was uh, speaking as a human being at that time, but on other occasions he knew uh, lots more, and he knew what's in the minds of people and so on. And where does he get that? He gets it from the Gospel according to John. So you're quoting Mark, he's quoting John and we had no way of putting it together. Now we have a single theory that puts it all together. We know why we are quoting Mark and we know why he's quoting John and we know why we should quote Mark and we know why he shouldn't be quoting John and when these disputes arise. Yeah. yeah. Sister, somebody has a hand. Yes. Um, actually, uh, Christians might quote from anywhere, might quote from anywhere, but it, the, the, the verses from John are, are so well known to them because th these are the verses now which so uh, closely correspond to their image of Jesus. So these verses are, are bandied about a lot, they know them a lot, and they don't e probably even know where it comes from. So I said, you might ask them, where does this come from? And they might tell you John. In fact, they, they may not even know. Yeah. Catholics are basically using the same books. When it comes to the New Testament, the, 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 the books are the same. Catholics use uh, Catholic Bibles, and Catholic Bibles have seven additional books in the Old Testament. Uh, but, but in the New Testament, the number of books uh, are, are the same, and they are the same books. Yeah. So then, uh, uh, as I said, the, the Christians themselves may not know where the verses come from, because to them, they're all the same, all the Word of God, and, and they don't know this apparatus. But now you know. And now you know that some of these favorite verses are actually coming from the Gospel according to John. The, the, the verse which is probably the most favorite in all of the, in the entire Bible, is John chapter 3, verse 16. If you um, happen to stay in a hotel and, and you find a Bible there in the hotel room, you open the first few pages, you will see some introductory material. And among the introductory material, there will be this John chapter 3, verse 16 in many Bibles, translated into a wide variety of languages, including Arabic and Urdu. Okay, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Turkish and so on, right? Uh, it's, it's there. John chapter 3, verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The most favorite verse in the entire Bible comes from the Gospel according to John, you see? So, if Jesus said this, then why is it not on, in all of the Gospels? This is a very important question. And so, so now you know. They may not know where the verses come from, but now you, you, you can suspect when they start to uh, quote verses, and now you can ask them. If they don't know, then there's something for both you and the other person to check with. Yes.
Yeah. So, question. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do we not have uh, writings from the companions of Jesus? Uh, uh, from the first, uh, you know, the physical issue of, of the writings themselves, and second, the, the theological issue of, of who should be seeking whose writings. Uh, as for the physical writings themselves, like why didn't the disciples write? Uh, because if they wrote, we would have had them. Uh, we would have had their writings. Uh, the, the answer to this generally in scholarship is that the disciples of Isa alayhi salam were Galile Galilean fishermen. Uh, in the Galilee, for, uh, to begin with, people were largely illiterate as opposed to Jerusalem, which was a city and in which people were, were, um, uh, were largely, uh, or, or the more, there were more literate people in, in the city than in this Galilee region. And second, the fact that uh, they, they were fishermen by trade um, it seems to put them in the class of, uh, of people who were not generally literate. Because if they were literate, probably they would be working in a different profession. A few people were literate in that time. The illiteracy was widespread, and uh, literacy was the exception. Uh, uh, who wrote then? Uh, people like Paul. Paul did come from uh, a city, he came from Tarsus, uh, he was literate uh, and he began writing and gaining followers and then two branches of Christianity emerged, one following Paul and another following the disciples of Isa a.s. And uh, those that followed the disciples of Isa a.s. insisted on um, following Jewish rules and that made it difficult to spread the religion to others outside of Jewish circles. And to spread it within Jewish circles had its own difficulties at that time, so Paul's religion uh, won out, uh, and his writings became popular, and followers of him, and the people who were co closely associated with his school, that's what eventually won out. So eventually it was later people who wrote the, the documents that we have now. Uh, Paul and, and some other people. But here, I, I know you guys are going to have questions, but if I don't uh, finish this now, we won't get our break, then, then, you know, everything gets delayed. So save your questions for later. Contact me by email and so on. Uh, remember that in this session, we want practice, 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 right? Okay, so let, let's put out the preliminary information, which you're going to think about. Very, very good question. Very relevant. Can you hold it? Because I know the sister has a good question too, and I've asked her to hold it well. So please hold it for later. Maybe, uh, maybe as we as we move out of here towards the Aster prayer and so on, we'll talk. Yeah. But but I'll come back to all of you guys with questions, as much as time will permit. Let let me finish this if you don't mind. Yeah. So I need to get on with some more uh, dates then. So. Isa a.s. is raised to heaven around the year 30. What have we introduced here? That Paul. Paul died around the year 64. So as I was uh, now saying about Paul, <laughs> it fits right into here. So before any of the Gospels are written, who was already there on the scene? <coughs> Paul. Right? And he wrote. So he sent out letters. Now I said how many books are there in the New Testament? How many books? Four. Uh, there are four Gospels. But how many books in the Old, New Testament? Uh, 27. 27. There are 27 books. Four of them are Gospels. Uh, now, so, so those are the four Gospels we're looking at. But there are other books besides. What other books? 13 letters begin by saying this is Paul writing. Okay? 13 books credited to Paul. And some of them are very small. It might be a letter. that one, On one occasion, Paul wrote a letter to one of his friends. And uh, that too is called one of the books, um, for if you want a better name, a document you might say, a shorter document. And, and they make up uh, the New Testament. So 13 credited to him in that way. There is one document which is anonymous, um, uh, uh, Hebrews. At one time people thought this was written by Paul as well, but it doesn't say who wrote it. It's anonymous. It's widely regarded by uh, Christian scholars as being anonymous. Nobody knows who wrote it. Which is very strange because, you know, in hadith studies, if, uh, if the origin of a hadith is unknown, this is munkar, it's rejected because it's majhul. The, 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 there is a person that is unknown. Uh, you can't take the information from an unknown person because anybody could have made up anything and passed it on and said, this is your religion, take this. So we want to know, who are you? Uh, and where did you get this from? Name, name your teacher. Where, where did that information come from? And not only your teacher, but who was his teacher? And, uh, did, 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 uh, and who was his teacher? We have to have a chain going all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that's how a, a hadith becomes known to be authentic. Now, if you have an unknown person in the chain anywhere, this becomes rejected because uh, of, of the unknown 
personal. So now if you take a whole book and you agree that this is from an unknown author and you compile it into what you call the Word of God, this to me is highly problematic. And some of their doctrine comes from there. Uh, so that's problematic. Uh, th that's the one that they admit to be unknown. But of course, as we are seeing now, the whole thing is uh, unknown, right? Uh, but, but Paul is known. And among the 13 letters that are credited to him, uh, there are seven which scholars generally say are, are really his, and the other six are written by some of his disciples and so on after him. Th that, that does not concern us so much now, uh, but the important thing is to know that, that the writings of Paul uh, preceded the writing of the Gospels. So if the Gospels show some influence from Paul's writings, uh, now you know that that's because of the obvious issue of the dating, right? Paul first, we said previously with Mark first, right? That's among the Gospels. But even before Mark, we have Paul. So, so Jesus leaves, Paul comes on the scene, he teaches, and uh, it, it is the communities that follow Paul, basically, uh, that will compile the writings and choose the writings uh, that they're going to follow. So the whole thing becomes now Pauline Christianity. When you get the uh, tape of um, the, the debate I did with uh, Carlton MacDonald a few days ago, uh, you will see that this was the question that came up. To what extent was Paul a follower of Jesus, or was he himself uh, a, 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 an inventor uh, of, of a new brand uh, called Christianity, and which scholars can now refer to as Pauline Christianity. A whole book has been written about this, entitled Pauline Christianity by John Zeisler, and I showed that book uh, during the debates as well. So, let me continue and then we have our break. So, Isa al -Islam is raised to heaven. What about Q? When is it written? It's written in the 50s. Remember I said earlier that even Q is late, so we, even, we can't even say that Q is the original uh, gospel of Isa al -Islam, though it would have been a collection of sayings of Isa al -Islam, uh, but, and, and we know of that because Matthew and Luke are copying from Luke, from Matthew and Luke were copying from? From Mark and from? Q. Q. And from Q, right? Remember I showed the arrows going both from Q and from Mark. So uh, Q was in there up about 20 years after Isa alayhi salam. So that's still, like, take 20 years. Can you remember something that somebody said to you 20 years ago? Maybe if, uh, like, like, let's say you lost your job 20 years ago. Maybe you remember the interview. Maybe you remember, like, your, your boss called you in there and, and your boss, uh, you know, um, let you go. But you don't remember what exactly he said. No, maybe you might be thinking, he must have said you're fired. But, but you don't have to be there to know that he said that. Anybody can imagine that that's what he would have said to you, you see? So sometimes people just imagine what would have been the natural thing for somebody to say, and they wrote that. They don't remember quite exactly what was said. If, you know, sometimes the sisters remember things that were said 25 years ago. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but, you know. Uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, but you know, seriously, um, you might remember something that is really meaningful to you or something that really hurts you or something like this. And I think this is where it is. So watch, brothers, because words do actually hurt. You know, you say six, six, six and stones will break my bones and words that will hurt me. But words do hurt, right? That's, that's why the words are remembered. And we think it was nothing because we didn't mean it all that, right? Um, but but uh, sometimes the meaning is understood. Um, in a different way. So, in any case, uh, forget about, uh, let, let's not lose track here. Uh, a card of religion, not, it's not a marriage. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, 20 years later, people could not remember precisely what Isa a.s. said. Um, in the case of the Quran, you know that to memorize the Quran, you have to keep repeating every, every day, right? And if you feel you were repeating for a while and you thought you knew it and you memorized it well, you didn't read it for a couple of years, you pick it back up again, you try to remember, you, you get it all mixed up, right? You start with one surah, you end up in another one, and so on. Uh, so you, if you think about the problem of people trying to memorize the sayings of Isa alayhi salam, if, if nobody was there on the scene writing it down, and, 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 and referring back to it again and again, how would they remember? It, it would be impossible to get the same things right. This is why when scholars study this today, they say that very few of the sayings of, of Jesus, even in Mark's Gospel, are, are authentically his sayings. They, they see that all of this has gone through a process of development and change over time. So it happened with Q and, and so on. Um, so I 
think that's about it. Uh, if we, if, if I push this slide forward, and I see we, we've gone on to an entirely different topic. So I, I'll, I'll leave it with you then to think about all of this problem of the sayings of Isa alayhi salam, how they were compiled, how they were written in the Gospels, and now we know how to use the Gospels in a, in, in a comprehensive way. Not just picking and choosing certain verses, but now we know when people are quoting from certain, uh, from John, we know how to deal with that. And we know why we would prefer to go to Mark for certain types of information. We have a more comprehensive view, and this is what I've tried to accomplish. So now our Dawa is taking another step for, forward. All right. So let's take a break, Brother Maru. Uh, that's not always helpful. We should we should have that uh, like as part of our arsenal again to be used wisely if and when necessary. Like you you're talking to somebody and he says, well, no, you should accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Sometimes they put it in a different way. They say, look, you guys believe that Jesus is a prophet. Yes. Okay, so that means you believe in everything he said, and you say yes, and then he said, well, look, the Bible shows that Isa al-Islam said this, therefore you should believe in him, uh, and you should believe this. Then you have to bring out the negative stuff, right? Now you have to say, well, you see, uh, over time, the Gospels have changed the image of Jesus, they changed what he said, and you can see this change going from Mark to John, because Mark was first, John last. And, and you can see that in Mark, he has limitations in his power, limitations in his knowledge. In John, he's made the creator of the, of the world. There's a change here. And uh, the stories and words of Jesus have been changed over time. So we believe in him, but we believe in, his, as, in him as he was originally. And how do we know of him as he was originally? We know it from the Quran, which for us is a revelation from God. So that's our dependable source. And... Uh, that's why we don't take the sayings of Isa as they are in the Gospels. But now, knowing that information means that that's the negative part that we want to keep for use sparingly, if and when necessary. But if you start with negative stuff, people get turned off, right? The positive stuff then, that's what we need to know. What does the Quran say about Isa alayhi salam? This is uh, something you can know for yourself by going to a copy of the Quran, go to the back where it has an index showing you the places where Isa alayhi salam is mentioned. Then you go to those verses, you read them. I read the 19th surah of the Quran, uh, Surah Maryam, has an extensive description there, right at the very beginning, starting with the story of Zachariah and John the Baptist, and then uh, the story of Maryam and her son. Go to Surah Al Imran from about the 40th uh, verse onwards, 42nd verse onwards, you find the story of uh, uh, Maryam and also of her son uh, right there. But now we'll look at some more comprehensive data from uh, the Muslim belief. We, we have two main sources the Quran and, and the Hadith, and uh, uh, this is what we believe about Isa alayhi salam. First of all, we should know that the Arabic word Allah means the God. Uh, so Muslims, we use the word Allah as the personal name uh, of the one and only God. So that's why we keep using the word Allah because now there's no confusion. We can say God as well, no, no harm, because the Quran says Ilah in Nas. He, he is uh, Ilah. Ilah in Arabic is what we're negating in the Kalima, right? When we say La Ilah Illallah. La Ilaha Illallah. There is no Ilah except Allah. So in Arabic, Ilah means a God and anything that people worship. But Allah is that one God that, that we worship. So uh, we, we say there's no Ilah, no true Ilah except Allah. And yet, the Quran also refers to Allah as Ilah. He is Ilahun Nas. He is the uh, God of humankind. So that, that, that's fine. We can use the word God in English, which is whatever people worship. Uh, but usually with capital G, it's referring to the uh, Christian God, which for us too is the same God as we will see. Okay, So we can use the term God, no harm, uh, uh, and especially if that will help our communication with others. But why do we generally as Muslims prefer to use the word Allah? Because now it's clear, because when people use the term God, maybe they mean Jesus, and that becomes confusing. So we say Allah and there's no confusion. Um, the Quran insists that there is only one God. This is uh, uh, the, the last uh, chapter of the, of the Quran. 
Uh, the Quran insists that the God of Muslims, Jews and Christians is the same God. I know you can't see the reference here, but I'll tell you what it is. It's Surah 29, verse number 46. I can't even see it here, but that's what it is. Surah 29, verse number 46, if you want to note that down. Uh, to continue then, the Annunciation and uh, the birth. Uh, action. So, uh, the Annunciation and birth uh, is mentioned uh, uh, that Annunciation means that the angel comes to tell Mary. Uh, that's called in technical, about in Christian tradition, it's called the Annunciation. Uh, so we can use the same term. Uh, that Isa al -Islam spoke as a child. Uh, he performed miracles, as mentioned in the Quran. Uh, so, so you, you can see that without knowing, without mentioning the specific verses, you can get an idea where they are. See that Surah Maryam, that's the third chapter, Surah Maryam. This is Surah Al-Ma'ida, that verse 110, this is near the end. So it's good to know roughly where things are, right? If you say Surah Al-Ma'ida, near the end. So you can go find it later on if you don't remember this verse number. Hmm? It's not, not easy to remember all these numbers. But uh, uh, Surah Al-Imran, near the beginning. Surah Al-Ma'idah near the end. This is how you think of things so you can easily find them later on. Uh, that he was rejected. Isa Alayhi Salam was rejected. Uh, he was rescued. Now this is Surah, the fourth chapter of the Quran. This is near the end. So 157. Alright, there are 174 verses in that, 176 verses in that Surah. But this is near the end, like a few pages in. Uh, so he was rescued and we believe that he will return. Okay, and that belief that he's returned, some link to these verses of the Quran, though there's nothing clear. Uh, it, that's just an interpretation. Uh, it's more clear in the hadith that Isa alayhi salam will return before the end of time and he will slay the Antichrist. Okay? Um, his message. Uh, his message, according to the Quran, is that uh, you should worship God, who is the God of everyone and God of Isa alayhi salam as well. And that's interesting that it's put this way because that corresponds to something that's mentioned even in the Gospel according to John. See, now when we can cite something from the Gospel according to John to prove our point, it becomes more powerful, right? Because if that Gospel was trying to show that Isa alayhi salam is God, or at least the creator of the world, and now it has something which shows that he's not God, then it even builds our case even stronger. Because it shows that the fact that Isa alayhi salam was not God uh, is so well known that even in the Gospel according to John that is shown as well. That, that's our point. So, uh, in, in the Gospel according to John he says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Right? My God. He has a God. And that's what the Quran says as well. In the same Ali Imran, yeah, keep your duty to God and obey me. That's what he says. A heaven is forbidden to anyone who associates partners with God. Uh, so that, that is his message. In the Quran it says that Isa alayhi salam said, uh, So this is what we find in the Quran about Isa alayhi salam. That's his message. Uh, he says when he was a, a, a child, uh, in Surah 19, verse number 31. This is Surah, which Surah is 19? Which Surah is 19? Surah Maryam, right? So 19th chapter. Uh, so he says, wa awsani bis salati wa zakati ma dum So that means if Allah enjoined on him prayer and he, that he's praying, who is he praying to? You know, it's so funny that many years ago I was uh, having a debate at Carlton University in Ottawa and uh, uh, so I, I said that uh, Isa alayhi salam uh, worshipped God and uh, according to the Bible because it shows that he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was worshipping uh, God that he fell on his, uh, his face and he prayed uh, so I said worship so the, the Christian gentleman said no it wasn't worship he wasn't worshipping uh, he was only praying so I don't know what's the, the distinction but anyhow to him this was important uh, so, uh, it, somebody picked it up and said to him, well, you know, if, if he was praying to God, then that obviously means that he wasn't God, right? Uh, and, and that was still a difficulty for him. So, anyhow, Isa alayhi salam was praying. So, he was praying, obviously, when, you, when he's praying, it's, uh, someone else is God, not him. And... Uh, 
uh, Jesus affirmed faith in the Torah, but also relaxed some of the Torah's restrictions. According to the Quran, he says uh, that I have been sent. So he relaxed some of that uh, which was forbidden. Uh, here we have the progression of law. Uh, where something might be prescribed at one time but repealed later on. That's fine uh, because laws are uh, to apply to certain circumstances and new circumstances may require new laws. And so he relaxes some of those laws. Uh, some of the laws are said to have been given to people because of the hardness of their hearts. So because they were so contentious uh, and asking for more details, they were given more details. But then Isa alayhi salam relaxed those details again for them. So uh, he did not ab abolish or change the entire law as uh, Christians generally uh, think he did. Why do Christians think that he did that? Who taught them that? Paul, right? Remember that very important name, Paul. So uh, the Quran strikes a balance. Uh, he, he didn't abolish the law, but at the same time, he relaxed some of the commandments. So now it makes complete sense. So if a Christian comes and finds something and says, look, Jesus did not uh, follow that law on a certain occasion. Well, yeah, he relaxed some of the regulations. See, Quran is very fair in that way. Uh, after Isa alayhi salam, another messenger will appear whose name is Ahmed. He says... Uh, that after me will come uh, the, the um, uh, one to come after me, his name is Ahmed. And we believe that to be our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is mentioned in Surah 61, which is 61, Surah as Sof, right? Okay, uh, so we go on. What became of Isa Alayhi Salam's message? Some of his uh, teachings were forgotten. The Quran says, this is Surah Al-Ma'idah. Uh, right close to the beginning you can see. Uh, some of his teachings were forgotten. The, the sects differed among themselves. Uh, some invented monasticism. This is Surat al-Hadid, so 57th chapter of the Quran. Some people invented monasticism. So, uh, you know, why, why can't Catholic priests marry? This was not from Isa al-Islam's teaching. This is uh, what people invented uh, later on. And of course we know there are problems associated with that, right? Because uh, we are human beings and Islam takes into consideration our uh, natural human needs. So we are allowed to fulfill our needs but within li important limitations, right? You eat but only that which is halal. Fulfill your sexual desires but only within marriage and so on. Um, but that monasticism people invented uh, for themselves. Uh, some distorted the scripture. Some distorted the scripture. This is important to know because uh, sometimes people come to us and say, well, how do you know that, um, that, that like, like, why do you not believe in the previous scriptures? When you say that you believe in the previous scriptures, why don't you accept the scriptures as they are? When we say we believe in the previous scriptures, but we don't accept them as they are because we, the, the, what they are is not the original scripture. It has been changed over time. You have the changed version. We want to believe in the original uh, version. Um, some of his teachings were forgotten. We already mentioned that. I don't know why I mentioned it twice. There you go. I'm going to take that out when I revise this. You forgot to. Uh, yeah, I see. I forget. Exactly. Forget and forget. All right. Uh, just to make sure we don't forget to do it twice. Okay. Okay. Did Jesus bear the sins of uh, others? Uh, from the Islamic perspective, no. And uh, here again, we are just presenting it from the Islamic perspective. And when you're presenting something from the Islamic perspective, you know, you have the full excuse because nobody can blame you for what you believe in this way, right? These are reasonable beliefs that you have as a result of the fact that you are Muslim. So you say, okay, this is what I believe. I, 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 I'm not saying anything to upset anyone. I'm just explaining to you what I, what I believe, right? So this is what I believe. When you say this is what I believe, you, you have the license now to, in a way, to offend, right? It's not your intention to offend, but, but, but you can say some things which the other person is not going to like, but it's all under the guise. It's not like you're saying it as a fact. Like if you say, look, this is the fact about Jesus, the other person is going to say, no, that's not a fact. But if you say, this is what I believe, he can't say, no, that's not what you believe. You see? So, so now you, you have the, under that guise, you have the chance now to say all of these things uh, without provoking a, a negative re reaction. The other person is not put on the, uh, not given the responsibility to correct you, right? Okay. So, 
The Quranic story of Adam is one of original forgiveness. This is in uh, Surah Taha. Uh, so one of, and that's towards the end. Uh, uh, one of forgiveness. So what do we mean by this? You see the Quran says, فَاجْتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ وَهَدَى His Lord uh, chose him uh, and forgave him and guided him. So you go to the Bible, uh, Adam committed that sin and then the curse of God comes on him. That all his generations afterwards will have to uh, suffer in this world and gather their bread from among thorns and thistles and uh, they will have to eat from the sweat of their brow. You know, and all the, Of course nowadays in the air-conditioned offices some people don't sweat. Um, it may be a little hot under the collar because of some of the, you know, sometimes the, the things which uh, they hope nobody will find out. Uh, <laughs> so so in, in the Bible there is this continued curse, right? And then the woman, they said, uh, according to the Bible, that she will suffer in childbearing because uh, uh, the Bible blames her for this whole problem, that she is the one who caused the man to eat. And uh, in fact, in many stories, the Bible is always like uh, putting blame on women. Like Samson was this great guy, but he had this wife Delilah who betrayed him and so on. So it's always like the women are betrayers and can't be trusted and things like that. So when people are thinking that something is, uh, you know, wrong in Muslim societies with women, of course, not entirely wrong. We, we don't treat our women the way the Quran uh, actually tells us to. Um, um, but if people are looking for problems, they should actually look in, in the Bible and they will see that there are lots of problems there in the way in which women are depicted. Whereas in the Quran, the story is revised. It's not that Eve is, is responsible. It's um, Adam alayhi salam is the one who is spoken about as having committed this when, when one person is spoken about. Otherwise, it's the two of them. So the shaitan caused the two of them to slip. Uh, from what they were, and so on. Um, uh, so no innocent person will bear the uh, guilt of the of the guilty one. All right. Uh, so it's not that Adam's sin is coming down all the way through the generations. This is our teaching. In the first place, he is forgiven, and uh, in the second place, uh, even if he was not forgiven, there's no need for anyone else to bear his sins. And God forgives those who repent and, and repair their wrongs. So the answer to Islam uh, as to who, for, who dies for your sins, you know, sometimes the Christians feel it's necessary for somebody to die for your sins. So they ask, well, who dies for your sins? And actually, uh, a lot of the times people just don't know that we have an alternative view. They just um, think that their view is the only one. And when they hear the Muslim view, it makes sense to them. Right? Because when you talk about forgiveness, they talk about forgiveness too. They say that uh, God, you know, you still have to ask God to forgive you, uh, and they still pray for forgiveness. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who are sin against us. It's part of what they call the Lord's Prayer. Well, then, how do we forgive those who sin against us? We just let them go, right? We we don't demand a price. It doesn't make sense to demand a price if you're going to forgive, and if you demand a price, you haven't really forgiven, have you? You you just took what was you to you. Um, forgiveness means you got, uh, just have to let it go. And this is what has happened in the case of uh, the story of Adam in the Quranic view. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him, that means he goes, and the rest of us too. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive us if we repent uh, sincerely. So that's what people are called to do. In their case, they say, no, somebody has to die for your sins. And then we say, okay, that means that we all go free. And they say, no, you, you don't go free. You still have to do what is right. You still have to avoid sins. And then if you fall into sin, you still have to ask for forgiveness. So then we can ask, well, how did the death of Jesus on the cross say, uh, change anything? Uh, and then they said, well, you know, kicked out of paradise now. Uh, okay, so if this is the solution through one man, sin entered the world, they say, through Adam. And now through Jesus, the penalty is paid and then the grace of God comes back in. Then we should all go back into paradise. Right? But uh, it didn't happen yet. That means that can't be the plan. It's more like the plan that we we'll live out this whole life, we'll live and, and die, we'll be tested here. This is what uh, Allah told us, and then eventually the judgment. That makes sense. But to say that uh, Isa comes to reverse that evil like that entered the world, that sin, based on which Adam is kicked out. Now Isa reverses it, so Adam did wrong, Isa did well, 
So now the whole thing should be reversed. We should be back in paradise. And then the paradise that was uh, Adam was kicked out from, according to the Bible, uh, was the Garden of Eden, which is located somewhere in the Mesopotamia, between the Nile and Euphrates River, somewhere in Iraq. So that means we should all return to Iraq. <laughs> and, uh, and they say that uh, Adam and Eve were naked in the garden, uh, in that state of blissfulness uh, before the sin. And then after the sin, that's when they started to cover their bodies. Okay, so then we should all uh, return to Iraq. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? Okay. The title is he's given in the, in the Quran. Um, he's called the Messiah. And, and Christians think Messiah means God. But Messiah doesn't mean God. Messiah is a title which um, uh, it, it means like one who is anointed. anointed. And that goes back to the uh, uh, tradition of the Israelites. That when they appointed somebody for office, they anointed his head with oil. Uh, and that, that was his inauguration. Uh, so the anointed one is the one who has been set aside for or or appointed in, a, in, a, in an office for some task. So Isa is God's Messiah. That's, that's what all it means really. There are many messiahs in the Bible. Um, God's word. Uh, in in the Surah 3, verse number 45, uh, he's referred to uh, Kalima. Kalima min. You would say he's a word from, from God. Waruham min. And he's a spirit from, from Allah. Surah 66 at Tahrim, Surah at Tahrim. He was a, a messenger of God. He's called a messenger, Rasul, uh, the prophet in Nabi, a servant of God, right? Abdullah, uh, son of Mary, right? Ibn Maryam. So these are the titles by which he is called in in Islam. Was he son of God? The general answer from the Quran is that God does not father children, uh, he does not beget children, he does not adopt children, he does not have children, he does not need children. Now, uh, why did I put it all in this way? Because sometimes our Christian friends say that, um, you know, the, the Quran seems to have the wrong idea. And that's why the Quran is objecting. They're saying, uh, the Quran is objecting. You know how the ayah says, وَلَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ sahiba He has no, no consort. So they're saying that the Quran seems to mean that for God to have a child, he would have to have a consort and then have a child. And they're saying, we don't say that. We don't say that he got a child through a consort. So the Quran is not answering us. The Quran is answering somebody else. Maybe the pagans of Arabia. And it is true that when the Quran is saying, how can a God have a son when he has no consort, uh, that would definitely be an answer to the people of, you know, the people of Arabia at the time, uh, who uh, thought in, in that kind of pagan manner. Uh, but at the same time, the logic carries through for everybody. Like, if you, if you say the Isa is the son of God, what kind of son do you mean? Okay, if, if he's uh, the, the, the literal son of God that we know usually comes from, like, literally son of somebody means one who comes from this pairing, from this partnership. It's, uh, so what kind of son do you mean? So do you mean adopted? Because some early Christians believe that God adopted Isa a.s. Not literally the son of God. But remember how we gave the example of a man, you know, saying to an orphan or something that you are my son. Um, that's that's adoption. If you take, you know, you can they can legally adopt somebody else's child and consider him your son. It's not literally your son, but now by by legal fiction. Uh, so, but but even that is denied in the Quran. So no matter what they say, if they say he he is eternally begotten, they say. Well, then the Quran says Allah does not beget. And uh, in short, he doesn't even have children. No matter how you put it, Allah does not have children. So that's the end of the story. But I wanted to press the logic a little bit more about Christians saying that Isa a.s. is the son of God. So if they say, okay, he has, we don't say he has a consort. So then, in what way, what, why did you use the term son? Like how did you come to this idea of son? If you say that Isa a.s. is co-eternal with God, uh, like that means they always existed together and they were always equal. Well then, what's that? That's more like a twin brother. 
So wh wh why do you use the term son? Where does the term son come from? It makes no sense to say son of God. <coughs> See? So all of this we have to deliver in a nice way, um, not to offend anyone, but just to explain to them that we have another viewpoint here, and that this viewpoint comes by way of this inspiration from the Word of God, the Quran, and we're just trying to share it with our fellow human beings. Okay, so uh, to continue, uh, then I, I just wanted to touch base. Uh, I just want to return here for a moment. You see this thing about needing children? Uh, that's one of the uh, considerations as well. Like, why would you attribute a son to God? Like we want children because we know that we're going to die and our children will live on after us. They will live on with our inheritance. They will inherit our genes, our names will be carried forward and so on. So we see our life as continuing in the children. Uh, so we, we have a certain need to have children, right? And the children always say to us, well I didn't ask to be born. Uh, you know, and that's just the nature of life. Uh, we need children. But God doesn't need children. See, uh, and, and that's how the Quran responds to that. Now, go, to go back here. A, a more specific answer. If that was a general answer about God having, um, not, not needing a son and so on. And now, well, is Jesus the son of God? The specific answer from the Quran is that Jesus did not claim to be the son of God. Others claim that for, for him. This is uh, Surah uh, Al-Baraha. Uh, Surah uh, At-Tawbah. Right? Um, so, uh, others claim that for him. And they are following the sayings of those who disbelieved of old. Right? It's not the um, Isa who claimed that. And then, Jesus is rather an honored servant of, of, of God. Surah al -Anbiya. He's an honored servant of Allah. This is what we want to see. He's an honored servant of Allah. Okay. To continue. Is Jesus God? According to the Quran, Jesus does not claim to be God. Uh, the Quran um, does not accept that Jesus does not accept that that, that Isa a.s. claimed to be God. Um, on the other hand, he's a miss. He, uh, oh, the, the Quran does not accept that that God is the Messiah. Right? The Quran does not accept that God is the Messiah. Uh, so if somebody says, In Allah, who al Masih of Maryam, the Quran is saying, No, that's uh, wrong. And then uh, the Quran does not accept that God is one of three when they say, In Allah, Thalithu Salata. So some people say that the Quran is mistaken here because uh, you know how it says one in three, like the third of three. They say, Well, uh, we, don't, we don't believe in three gods. Christians say we don't believe in three gods, and they're true. They're right. They don't believe in three gods. Well, at least in professing, they don't. They, they say we only believe in one God, but we believe there are three persons: Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And each of these persons is God. But the three together is still God, and only one God. So, so they're not not professing three gods. They they, they say, and we say, okay, sure, you're not professing three gods, uh, but but they're saying that. The Quran is wrong here but for saying three. But but look at it again. Does it say three gods? No. It doesn't say three gods here. Does it say brothers? Yeah? No. And even in the Arabic, it doesn't say three gods. Uh, three. It doesn't say three what? So they are saying three persons. And the Quran is saying, La taqulu thalatha. Do not say three. So again, it didn't say, do not say three gods. It's saying, do not say three. So what's, what's wrong in this statement is the way the three comes in. That's all. And the Quran, by its very nature, uh, does not say more than is necessary. <coughs> That's the, the Quran tells you what is necessary and leaves the rest for you to figure out. Okay? So the Quran is saying, do not say three. So if they, if they stop saying three, then everything is fine. And, and that's what the Quran is saying. So the Quran is not mistaken. And they say we don't say third, because when they say about uh, Isa a.s., they say he's the second person of the Holy Trinity. They don't say third. Uh, but of course there have been a variety of beliefs among Christians over history and one cannot say that when the Quran is speaking now it's speaking to the uh, modern American tel uh, televangelist or something like this uh, the, the Quran obviously had a more immediate sort of concern with the people to whom it was first addressed so we have to find the specific groups of Christians at that time and see what exactly they believe uh, and, and that's not entirely easy uh, but there's another thing to note about the Quran
that the Quran actually is 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 dialectic in its in its discourse. Uh, uh, let, let me start with a story, and then perhaps the point will be uh, a little bit clearer. Uh, some time ago, a, a brother told me that. Um, uh, the, 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 there was among the Arabs this, this priest and um, uh, some, some one of the Muslims invited him and said, you know, come, come and just, uh, you know, come to my home and uh, let's have dinner together and uh, bring, bring your wife and kids. Well, of course, the, this was a priest who wouldn't get married uh, following the, some tradition of monasticism or, or at least celibacy. So the priest said, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have a wife. Right? So, and as if like something is really wrong to have a wife and, and children. So, the uh, brother then responded to him, well, why do you say that, you know, God has children, right? So, they, 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 the point here is that uh, you know, when the brother said, bring your wife and children, uh, he knows already that the priest doesn't have a wife and children, but he's setting him up, you see, yeah. to get him to think. So, in a lot of ways, the Quran is actually setting people up to think, like to tell them something so that they would have a kind of a response, and in their response, they will realize the truth for themselves. So, even if they did not say that, or some people today are not saying that God is a third of three, so they should ask themselves, why not? Like, if they say, Isa um, is uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity, but not the, we don't say the third person. He's not the third, he's the second. So now, uh, we should ask them, well, why not the third? Or why not the first for that matter? Why is he second? Why, why do they have these specific uh, designations? First, second, third. If they're first, second, third, isn't there a kind of a hierarchy? Or, or a, a, a status... Uh, um, uh, some, some status is applied to one but not to the other. In that case, how are they co-equal? So, it, it, it generates a sort of discussion. And that's part of the Quran's purpose as well. Like, the Quran is not always telling you the thing exactly like, you know, this is the command of Allah, just do this. The Quran is not always like this. Sometimes the Quran is telling you the opposite. Like, for example, when the Quran uh, says, uh, um, bring your proof to the, to the Christians, knowing that they don't have any proof. So how, what, what proof are they going to bring? It's telling them something which is actually impossible. They don't have re a real proof. They might bring something, but it's that they don't have exactly. And when the Quran says, uh, basu, so wait, wait until Allah brings His commandment to pass. That means they're disobeying Allah, and uh, the Quran's whole invitation to them is to stop disobeying Allah, and now come to the right path, and then they'll be saved. But the Quran is saying instead, in passages like this, okay, wait. Wait till Allah bring His commandment to pass. That means stay as you are. Don't do anything different. You wait, and, and Allah will punish you. So the Quran is basically telling them, in a way, stay as you are, but it means you shouldn't stay as you are. You see? It's, it's really telling them something in a way that should make them think. And, and that's part of what we need to understand about the Quran as well. So, finally, the Quran says, La tukulu salasa, do not say three. So the Quran is rejecting this idea of uh, saying three. We're going to have to break very soon, and I want to get some practice in, so let me uh, just continue with this very quickly. According to the Quran, Jesus had human limitations. What does the Quran say? He had to eat, so too did his mother. They used to eat food. So how can you say that they are God? Uh, or Isa alayhi salam at least that the Christians today say he's God uh, sometimes they say well we don't take Maryam as God so why is the Quran saying that uh, people took Maryam alayhi salam, as, uh, alayhi salam as God well there have been some people in the past who took her as God and so naturally the Quran is reacting to that and uh, uh, to a certain extent too the rest of the people need to think if you, if, if you take Isa alayhi salam as God and he was born of Maryam alayhi salam, then what was she? If she was completely human, which we all agree that she was, then where did the divinity part come from? If, if the child is born of her, from her flesh and, and blood, well then, this can only be uh, human, right? And if that human uh, flesh and blood is all human, then where is the God in him? If you say that the spirit that came from God and uh, alighted onto uh, Isa alayhi salam or somehow infused his body, well that means he wasn't human because he had a human flesh but a, a, not a human spirit. See that? 
Then she Christians uh, insist that Isa is completely man and completely God. He had to be completely man. So to be completely man, he has to have like uh, not only the appearance of a man, but he has to have a human soul, right? Because what makes us man? It's it's the soul. Otherwise, we're not human, right? We we could be a ve like some people have been reduced to vegetative states and they're just hooked up to some machines. Uh, but uh, if, you know, if, what makes us human is that we have that human soul, right? Okay, so. If Isa a.s. is completely human, he had to have the human soul. If he just had human body and divine soul, then uh, he's not completely human. Something is wrong. So now if they say, okay, well, okay, yeah, so give him a human soul. Now he's completely human. Uh, but then, if he has a human soul and he has a divine spirit in the same body, then uh, the, the divine spirit never became a man. It's just occupying a human body, right? So they, they, but that divine spirit is separate from the man. Uh, it's like if the, in the New Testament, the expression is used that uh, uh, we are the tent in which God dwells. So that means like the Christians believe that God comes in them as well. So if if, they, if God coming in them doesn't make them God, well then if God came into Jesus, how does that make Jesus God? You see, the, the, the theology does not add up, no matter, you, you, you can turn it from this side or that side, every angle shows you a, a different problem, and it's just because the core issue is highly problematic. Okay, so let's continue then. He had to eat, his miracles were done by God's permission, so we don't deny that he did great things, but we say that whatever great thing he did was by God's uh, permission. Uh, and uh, God aided Jesus with the Holy Spirit. The Quran says, Jesus' knowledge was limited according to the Quran. For example, when he says, Do you know what is in my mind? But I don't know what is in, in your mind, and so on. Okay, then, according to the Quran, Jesus is one of God's worshippers. Uh, when he said that I was, I've been commanded to pray and to fast and so on. And he is dependent on, on God, of course, because if God decides to uh, destroy Isa a.s. and his mother, then that would be the end, right? Of Isa a.s. and his mother. So they are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for their continuation and their, their sustenance. Uh, in short then, this is the... Um, uh, Quranic depiction of Jesus, a restatement of the, the Jesus' message. The Quran calls the disciples of Jesus uh, Muslims, and uh, that's because the word Muslim itself means what? Submission, right? The one who submits to God is called a Muslim. And since they submitted to God, they're called Muslims in this generic sense. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu now reaffirms the message of Isa salam in, in the Quran. So uh, now, if you want to find the message of Isa salam, where do we go? The Quran. Quran. And, and that, in short, is uh, our, our message to our uh, Christian friends. So now we have both uh, the positive and the negative. We're going to stress the positive. Uh, and, and you're going to use the negative if and when necessary. When somebody comes and says, you know, look, but we have the truth about Jesus here in our Bible. Well, how do you respond to that? Now you have to get back to the whole thing about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see where Paul fits in, and all of that. So, in a few minutes uh, uh, that we have remaining before we break for the uh, Maghrib Salah, uh, let's do some pairing, yeah? Okay, so... Uh, almost sounds like we're doing some Bluetooth uh, pairing, but anyway, pairing. Uh, so, uh, different people this time, right? So, uh, last time it was the two of you together? Oh, you went across. Okay, behind, so then two, and two, and two, and two, and if you're going to be out, then 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 you're